The 1970 Cadillac turns the corner on the 60s, carrying with it into the new decade the leadership of the old and all the advancements in performance and handling, in comfort and convenience. Since the beginning of the 60s, much has changed and much has continued. The appearance has changed considerably in the last 10 years, but the Cadillac poise and character remain clear to the eye. On the 1970 Cadillac, the grill is new, but it's certainly a new Cadillac grill, at once recognizable, not possibly the grill of any other car. A familiar identification is missing. The V under the crest will not appear on any 1970 Cadillac. The crest alone, somewhat larger than before, adorns the nose of the hood, which also has a new bright chrome front molding, the Fleetwood wreath and crest continue to distinguish Fleetwood Cadillacs. And this winged crest appears on the fender nose of all cars. But on the Eldorado, it is molded on the outside of the parking and front turn signal lamp lens. On the subject of lamps, you will notice some changes in their treatment and sizes on all Cadillacs. Some of these changes represent natural styling development and some are responses to federal lighting requirements for passenger cars, stipulating that certain lamps and reflexes be increased either in brightness or in size if they did not previously meet the so-called Class A lighting requirements. These requirements apply specifically to front and rear turn signals, front and rear side marker lamps and reflex assemblies, and rear reflexes. The rear reflex shown on this DeVille is in the lower bumper outer end beneath the newly styled tail lamp. The tail lamp housing can be removed by prying the bumper downward, preferably after loosening the upper bumper to body attaching bolt. Backup lamps have been repositioned to the center bumper bar flanking the license plate holder. The lamp assembly is taken out through the license plate opening after the removal of two screws underneath the bumper. On the Eldorado, the rear reflexes in the bumper have been increased in size, and the tail lamp assembly, designed to present a very sleek, trim appearance, uses two bulbs for increased brightness to accommodate lighting requirements. Returning to the front of the Eldorado, the radiator grill, which is itself new, is perhaps just as interesting for what it says as for how it looks. Eldorado, 8.2 liter. This plaque announces the Eldorado's 500 cubic inch engine, putting Cadillac still another step ahead of the industry in passenger car power output. This engine, standard on Eldorado and not available for other Cadillacs, has the largest displacement of any production engine in the industry. It was developed from the basic 472 Cadillac engine. It is rated at 400 horses. The added power is produced by a new longer stroke crankshaft, which also develops increased torque in the medium speed range. The new crankshaft is not very different in appearance, but can be identified by the letter D on the number one counterweight. While both engines have new pistons, the new Eldorado piston, shown on the right, is mini-skirted and shorter-headed to provide clearance for that longer crankshaft stroke. Low compression pistons will not be necessary or available for any engine in 1970. And oversized pistons are not available for the Eldorado 500 engine. Both engines in 1970 have a compression ratio of 10 to 1. The timing is set at 7.5 degrees before top dead center, and both engines feature a slightly hotter spark plug, R46N. The Eldorado oil pan is new with two drains, the new drain being located in the front sump, which is somewhat deeper than before, making it necessary to remove both drain plugs when draining the oil. The 1970 crankcase, which had to be changed only slightly and was actually incorporated in late 1969 engines, is common to both the 500 and 472 engines. The crankcase and the Eldorado front engine mount brackets can be used in service for 1969 and 1968 engines. On all engines, choke operation has been improved for startup performance by the addition of a stainless steel cup 
pressed into the intake crossover passage, making the choke more responsive to exhaust gas temperature. And a new vacuum brake unit delays opening of the choke valve to prevent stallout after startup. Be sure to check your shop manual for the new method of setting the idle speed adjustment using a higher RPM, 600 RPM instead of 550. And do not be surprised by the absence of the stainless steel gasket formerly located beneath the carburetor. This gasket has been canceled for 1970 carburetors and under no circumstances should one be installed. On all engines, the AIR system AIR pump and all has been replaced by a controlled combustion system, CCS. This system is designed to keep inlet air, air entering the carburetor, at a temperature of approximately 100 degrees Fahrenheit or more during the warm-up period. This improves vaporization of the air-fuel mixture in the specially calibrated quadrajet carburetor, resulting in a reduction of hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide in the exhaust gases. The controlling action of CCS takes place in the air cleaner. A vacuum motor assembly in the air cleaner snorkel, you can see the top part of it here extending above the snorkel, keeps underhood air from entering the air cleaner when the engine is shut off and when the engine is running but underhood air has not yet reached 100 degrees. And the vacuum diaphragm keeps the snorkel closed to underhood air by means of the control damper assembly to which it is linked. Vacuum to the vacuum motor is admitted by a passage through a combination air bleed valve and temperature sensor in the air cleaner base. This vacuum holds the vacuum motor diaphragm closed against spring pressure. However, heated air around the exhaust manifold is captured by a manifold shroud and directed up a hot air pipe leading into the air cleaner and carburetor. As the engine warms up, and the temperature of underhood air rises, the sensor air bleed valve in the base of the air cleaner, which is sensitive to surrounding air, starts to open, venting air into the vacuum holding the diaphragm closed. As it opens to outside air, the vacuum motor diaphragm begins to yield to spring pressure, allowing some warmed up underhood air to pass through the snorkel, and at the same time, the control damper assembly starts to close off the preheated air from the hot air pipe. Eventually, the hot air pipe is closed altogether as the air bleed valve opens further and the warmed up underhood air is free to pass through the snorkel into the air cleaner. Thus, the vacuum motor assembly controlled by the temperature sensor air bleed valve regulates the temperature of inlet air to provide the most desirable exhaust emission level. The use of regulated preheated air has eliminated the need for the manifold heat control valve. Also helpful in reducing exhaust emissions is the transmission controlled spark advance feature. TCS, by means of an electric pressure sensing switch in the transmission and a vacuum solenoid, eliminates vacuum advance in any forward gear except high when the engine is at normal operating temperature. In first and second gears, the switch in the transmission is closed, energizing the vacuum solenoid, which shuts off vacuum to the thermal vacuum switch, thus shutting off distributor vacuum. When the transmission shifts into high, direct clutch apply oil causes the transmission switch to open, de-energizing the vacuum solenoid, allowing normal vacuum advance. When engine operating temperature is above 220 degrees, Vacuum is supplied by the manifold vacuum port of the thermal vacuum switch, providing full vacuum advance, and the transmission controlled spark feature is bypassed. The vacuum solenoid is located on the ignition coil bracket. On one end, it has two ports with hoses leading to the thermal vacuum switch and the air cleaner. And on the other end, a port with a hose leading to the carburetor throttle body and the electrical connection to the transmission switch. On California cars, there's yet another system. On Cadillac cars destined for registration in California, there will also be an evaporation loss control system designed to protect against the loss of fuel vapors from the fuel tank to the atmosphere. 
Vapors emanating from the tank when the car is parked are captured and routed through a line leading to a bed of activated charcoal in the vapor absorption canister located in the left front of the engine compartment. The vapor is absorbed in a bed of activated charcoal. Another line leads from the top of the canister to the air cleaner. When the engine is running, fuel vapor is drawn from the canister through this line to purge the absorbent charcoal bed. To prevent the charcoal from becoming oversaturated with excess vapor, another line leading from the bottom of the canister serves as a vent to the atmosphere. This line also draws in air for the purging process. To prevent liquid fuel from entering the line running from the fuel tank to the canister, a liquid vapor separator adjacent to the tank catches the liquid fuel and returns it to the tank, allowing the vapors to pass on to the canister. There is also a filling control device inside the tank, which prevents it from being completely filled with fuel, making the fuel tank capacity on California cars approximately two gallons less than other cars. This will keep fuel from spilling into the liquid separator and allow room for the expansion of heated fuel. Every 12 months or 12,000 miles, the filter in the bottom of the vapor canister must be replaced. Looking around elsewhere under the hood of the 1970 Cadillac, the right shoulder of the radiator has a different angle to accommodate low hood styling and the new transmission cooler. The locking provision of the radiator cap has been changed so that it is very difficult, if not impossible, to remove the cap unless it is in the safety or remove position. To remove the cap, turn it counterclockwise without pressing down about a quarter of an inch to the pressure relief position. Before turning further, let the pressure exhaust itself, which may take some time if the engine is extremely hot. Then continue the counterclockwise turn, pressing down on the cap until the safety or remove position is reached. New flexible fans in 1970, seven bladed for the Eldorado and 75s, five bladed for other cars eliminating the fan clutch. And on all except the limousine and commercial chassis, the idle speed-up device is eliminated as well. The steering pump has interior refinements for improved oil flow, and the fin-type fluid cooler on air-conditioned cars has been eliminated except on Eldorado. Air-conditioned 75s and commercial chassis vehicles will have a tube-type cooler. The major development related to steering, however, is the integral ductile iron steering knuckle, new on all Cadillacs except Eldorado. The new knuckle is actually an integral steering arm, brake caliper support, and steering knuckle, made of one piece instead of three, requiring three bolts instead of seven, a strong, reliable component similar in concept to the Eldorado knuckle. The revised front disc brake splash shield is interchangeable for right and left knuckles. Up at the steering wheel, we have a new pad and shroud and different horn blowing provisions. The horn is sounded by depressing the crested button in the center of the pad or any of the three pressure points at the outer ends of the spokes. Down on the steering column, the ignition lock cylinder has been revised to make it necessary for the driver to push in with his ignition key in order to reach the accessory position. The instrument panel presents new emblems for all cars, but is basically carryover with only minor appearance changes. You will find all cars feature vacuum cruise control, previously available only on Eldorados, and a rear window defogger on convertibles. The Cadillac customer's listening pleasure will be enhanced by the 1970 radio features. While the AM-only radio has been dropped from the lineup, a new AM-FM push-button radio is offered. An AM-FM signal-seeking radio is available on all cars, and an AM-FM stereo set with signal-seeking is available on all cars but the 75 series and commercial chassis. An AM-FM signal-seeker with rear seat control is offered for the Fleetwood 75. In addition, all signal-seeking models will offer the remote-control foot switch 
as a dealer installed option. On the 1970 radios, the first and last push buttons on left and right are indicated as AM and FM push buttons. Each of them has a dual function. When the left M AM button is pushed, it selects the AM band for the radio, and it also tunes in the AM station for which it is set. The FM push button on the right selects the FM band for the radio, and also tunes in the FM station for which it is set. On stereo signal-seeking radios, the owner who wants to listen to stereo has an extra convenience. If he moves the sensitivity slide switch all the way to the right, the signal-seeking tuner will stop on stereo stations only, as long as the radio is in the FM mode. Recent advancements in the integration of radio circuits, allowing components to be further miniaturized, have made it possible to mount the stereo amplifier right in the receiver. It is no longer a separate unit. Also in 1970, the radio antenna is embedded in the laminate between the windshield glass. It is very important with this antenna that the lead-in cable be solidly mounted to the dash and that the antenna be trimmed properly. In the next film, the October roundtable portion of the new product presentation, we will look especially at the completely new differential rear axle area, the third member of the powertrain, which has special implications and interest for the Cadillac serviceman and the Cadillac owner. And we'll see what else is new in the DeVille. The Fleetwood. The El Dorado. As Cadillac moves into the 1970s, as confidently as it moved into the 1960s. Still the sure leader, still the almost magic name. And of all who strive to capture the imagination of its market and the loyalty of its owners, the most successful by far. Every generation, every decade,